All right, welcome everybody to Citizen Science in the Library, Turn Your Curiosity into Impact. Um, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping. Um, if you need to access the chat or use the Q&A function, um, find the toolbar. It'll be either on the bottom or top of your Zoom window. If you just hover your mouse over there, you should find that. Um, we'd love for you to introduce yourself in the chat box. Anytime you use the chat box, just keep in mind, um, use the drop down menu next to two and select everyone. I think the default is panelists um, and that would only go to us, but so we would love for you to share your ideas and questions and thoughts with everybody. So make sure you change that to everyone and go ahead and introduce yourselves and where you're coming from. Um, you will not have microphone access or video access during this presentation, but the chat is wide open for you to engage. All right, and here we go. So first off, uh, just quick facilitator introductions. My name is Claire Ratcliffe Adams. I'm joining you all from StarNet. Uh, we are located in Boulder, Colorado. I'm joined here with my colleague, Dylan Connolly, and our speaker for the day, Caroline Nickerson. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves. So Dylan, hand it off to you. Hi everyone, I'm Dylan Connolly. I am a education specialist at, at uh, the Space Science Institute and StarNet, and I'm really excited to be helping provide chat support for this webinar. Uh, so as y'all come up with any questions or anything you would like highlighted, I'll be keeping an eye on the chat. Just go ahead and throw those questions in there. I'll try and make sure they get answered. Awesome, thank you, Dylan. I've, I've told Dylan to feel free to interrupt me throughout with any of interesting thoughts that people have or questions people have, because this presentation is for you all. It's meant to be a resource for you. And I wanna make sure that I'm talking about things that you care about and that are helpful to you um, during your Citizen Science Month efforts or your Citizen Science programming throughout the year, not just during Citizen Science Month in April. So please, please, please be liberal about asking those questions. We want to um, have a dialogue with you. Uh, I'm Caroline Nickerson, I'm from SciStarter. I'm gonna tell you more about what SciStarter is in a second, but um, basic in intro about me is I'm a big citizen science enthusiast. I love doing science uh, and learning new things about the world and working with libraries is always such a blast. You all are leaders in your communities. You know what resonates with your communities. Um, so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk to you today and to the um, folks at StarNet, especially. We did this webinar last year and it was a lot of fun. So we're back. I think it's a three-peat now. I think this is our third Citizen Science Month webinar. So thank you again. And uh, I'll hand it back to Claire. Thank you. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Beatrice Chavez. She is in the chat as well from StarNet. So she will be dropping some helpful links in the chat. Um, Beatrice, you can go ahead and do that now. Um, this is a link bank that includes all of the URLs to the resources that Caroline will be talking about today. Um, so you can fully just listen. Don't worry about taking notes. Um, we've done that for you. So uh, if you have any questions as well, um, my email and Caroline's email are in that link bank as well. If after the presentation, you would like to reach out to us for any questions. All right, so we're gonna start off with a quick little icebreaker to introduce uh, citizen science. Um, so my question for you all is how long has the longest running citizen science project been going? Um, this is the longest project in our nation and possibly the world according to Smithsonian Magazine. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and launch this poll. Uh, so you can actually Click right into it, here we go. Your options to choose from are three months, two decades, 122 years, or 200 years. What do you think has been the longest running citizen science project? All right, we've got answers rolling in. I'll give you about 20 more seconds to select your choice. All right. Okay. And I will show those results. And the majority of you were correct. Uh, the answer is 122 years. 
Um, so if we have any bird watchers in the group, this was the Audubon Christmas bird count. Um, so prior to the turn of the 20th century, um, hunters engaged in a tradition of doing a Christmas uh, side hunt where they went out and they did a bird hunt. Um, and conservation was just beginning to start at that time. And many people started becoming concerned about declining bird populations. Um, so beginning on Christmas day in 1900, ornithologist Frank Chapman started a Christmas bird census um, that would count birds. So over 25 bird counts were held that day in locations across the country, even up in Canada. Um, and the tradition continues today from December 4th to January 5th each year. Um, so the Audubon Society and other organizations use data collected in this long running wildlife census to assess the health of bird populations and help guide conservation action. action. Um, so congratulations, you all. Well, 56% of you got that correct. All right. All right, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand it over to Caroline to talk about SciStarter and how libraries can get involved with citizen science. Awesome. Thank you so much, Claire. I'll share my screen. Um, some of you, uh, I see some familiar names in the chat. So some of you may have seen um, this before. If you have done Citizen Science Month programming um, or if you've um, just been part of SciStarter's efforts, that's okay. Um, I'm counting on folks who may have seen some of this material before to ask the really hard-hitting questions and turn this into a discussion. Um, but, and for those of you who may have seen it before but maybe didn't do anything for Citizen Science Month last year, um, are, you know, are just really getting started with citizen science and thinking about putting it into your library or through your community-based organization. Um, hopefully, um, I had a professor one time, she said that learning is like waves on the beach. You have to really learn something again and again before it really sinks in. Um, and I, I, I think that's true. So um, Citizen Science Month, it, is, it happens every year. It's a big celebration of citizen science. It's really an excuse to celebrate because you can do citizen science in your library any old day of the year. Um, but I think April is going to be a lot of fun. And I really hope that um, if you don't join us this April, that you plan for Citizen Science Month 2023 or do something later this year. But really quickly, a bit about me. Uh, this is me out and about in my natural habitat um, in Florida. I was at a science festival in 2019 um, doing the Globe Observer Project with people. So I, I like putting this picture out there because you can do citizen science anywhere. You know, you can do it at a festival. You can do it on your couch. You can do it in your library. Um, you can do it with your smartphone. You can do it on a computer. You can do it on a data sheet and send your data in later. It's a really, really diverse field. I saw in the chat earlier that some people hadn't heard of citizen science before. So I want Somewhat, I want everybody to learn something from today. If you haven't heard of citizen science before, no worries, we'll get you up to speed. If you've done a bunch of it, that's okay too. Hopefully you'll learn something new or this will spark a new idea um, for how you can deepen your engagement. Um, so just roughly what I'm gonna be running through to get your gears turning. I'll talk a little bit about SciStarter's library network. I'll go over what Citizen Science Month is, how you might be able to plan for it. I know it's coming up. We're already at the end of February. It's Citizen Science Month this coming April. I have some ideas for things you can do that aren't like a full-fledged program, but we'll get to that when we get to that. Uh, and then we'll talk about promoting your event and we'll end with questions. And honestly, this questions tab should link throughout because um, I want you to, you to feel comfortable sharing your thoughts and questions throughout. And um, because I can't see the chat, um, Dylan has free reign to let me know what y'all are saying. So this can really be a discussion. So we have a library network at SciStarter and it was in that awesome link blank bank that Claire shared. And basically what this is, it's, it's, um, it's a, a group you can join to stay up to date on all things citizen science. And what is citizen, and citizen science in libraries, I mean, and what is citizen science? Uh, it's a really broad term. Some libraries, I saw someone from Los Angeles Public Library was here with us today. Um, some libraries might call it neighborhood science. Um, other libraries might use the term community science or public engagement science, or some people may just call it science. The main thing to know is citizen science is real science. It's any way that anyone can move science forward and it's global. There has been documented citizen science on every single 
continent. Um, but in short, it's a global movement that enables people from all walks of life to participate in real scientific research by making and sharing observations with scientists. Um, and by doing that, typically people are collecting or analyzing data. What is data? Data is just information. So you can do citizen science just by taking a picture of um, a tree you see in your community and sending that to a research project so they can, uh, they can keep track of what tree species appear where. Or you can do citizen science by playing the stall catchers game. The stall catchers project is one of my favorite citizen science projects because by playing this game, you are making annotations for Alzheimer's researchers to speed up the search for a cure. Um, and that's a, that's a really fun project. I actually have a, a picture of a library doing it in their computer lab later in the presentation. But I bring both those examples up just to show that citizen science can be simple, but the impacts can be big. Um, and why do you think your community might want to do citizen science? Um, it might be because they're really passionate about astronomy and they want to help protect the night sky from light pollution. Or it might be because you just know that your um, group of high schoolers really dig squirrels and you think that the project squirrel pro um, citizen science project where you can take pictures of squirrels and make observations about them to help study tree squirrel ecology, you know that project would be a hoot and it would also make an impact on squirrels, which your community might care about. Um, you can also do it to teach different skills. Maybe you um, are, are working with a group and you want to teach them about um, attention to detail. Are, um, there are also tie-ins with civic engagement. Um, there are all different reasons to do citizen science, but ultimately we do it because we wanna make an impact because citizen science is real science. It's actually creating knowledge about the world. So SciStarter is your place where you can discover all sorts of different citizen science opportunities. Um, so on SciStarter, there are thousands of projects, events, and tools. So for projects, those are typically added by researchers for anybody and everybody to discover. So let's say that I am really curious about the brain. Um, I could go to SciStarter, I could search the word brain in the project finder, and the Nareka project might come up. The Nareka project is a project based out of Ireland, but anywhere, anywhere, in the, anyone, anywhere in the world with a smartphone can participate in the Nareka project. You basically just play games and answer questionnaires to help these researchers at Trinity College in Dublin understand how dementia, memory, um, and other mental health um, factors um, affect our brain. Um, it's a really, really cool project, and I could find that on SciStarter wherever I am in the world. Uh, so that's the projects. People add local or global projects to SciStarter that volunteers can join to advance research. But um, anybody can add an event. I had tons of events. Um, I am in Washington, D.C. today, actually. And I know in the past, um, when I lived in D.C. full time, I used to do meet citizen science meetups in my local library. I would just book a room, a study room at the local library, and I'd invite my classmates to come and do citizen science with me. And I'd add those events to SciStarter. So other people in the D.C. area might be able to discover them. Um, so if you all are doing citizen science at your library, add that to SciStarter. And if it's time bound, you know, add that to the event. You could say from April 1st to April 30th, um, we have book displays up about citizen science. That counts as an event. Or maybe you're doing a webinar for your patrons. Add that to SciStarter um, so people can discover it and participate. Um, or maybe your astronomy club is going to do Globe at Night add that to SciStarter. Say, you know, on April 15th um, at 8 p.m. local time, my astronomy club's doing Globe at Night. And if you add that event, you could use SciStarter's People Finder to message everyone in your area and invite them to participate um, if they have a SciStarter account. Um, and the list goes on and on. And we also have a tools database um, where you can discover different citizen science tools. But I think the most useful page for you all to get started is SciStarter.org forward slash library. Um, because this library network, I really recommend that you all join if possible because it helps you build capacity, support your community, broaden your participation, and just shape and accelerate scientific research. Um, it's a collection of resources. There's a newsletter. Um, there are, um, I, I, earlier at the beginning of the event before everyone joined, I, we were going back and forth in the chat with a librarian on the line named Sarah. Sarah has um, the measuring light in the night kit 
but the templates are provided on Science Starter's website, she has that kit in her library. So if you all join the library network, you'll be the first to know about these different citizen science opportunities. Um, I'm gonna keep going because today's focus is really Citizen Science Month, but to summarize all the words that you see on the screen, um, by being part of SciStarter's library network, you're part of a, a real community to enhance citizen science in your library. Um, so you can find that at SciStarter.org forward slash library dash network. And that's also um, in the link bank that Claire shared. Um, another resource we provide to libraries is we have trainings. Um, so these trainings were made um, with support from the network of the National Library of Medicine, as well as from uh, with support from instructional designers at Arizona State University. There's a general training um, that you'll find on the library network page that's linked on there that you could have your, um, your community do. So they could get a citizen science badge and they can learn about the who, what, when, where of citizen science and what they might need to participate. And then there's a secondary training for library staff that you can participate and also get a badge um, that is an even more comprehensive overview of how libraries can interface with citizen science. And we have some network webinars too that we invite you to. There are so many resources for you all, it makes me happy. So what is Citizen Science Month? Um, so it was originally Citizen Science Day and we have our founder, Darlene Cavalier up on the slide. Um, she really spearheads these things. Um, Citizen Science Month, so it was too much for a day. And a few years back, we made it a month. Um, it's every April and it's ex an excuse to celebrate citizen science and build awareness with your community. And there's no right or wrong way to celebrate Citizen Science Month or to bring citizen science to your library. The basic goals are to increase awareness of citizen science, to support librarians to host citizen science programs and events, and to broaden participation in citizen science because citizen science is for everyone. Anyone of any age can do real science. That's the basic message of the month. That's what we want to get across and we want you all to be our partners in that. Um, so there's real data backing up the impact of this. I wanted to give you um, some basic summary stats about what happened in 2021. So there were over 250 events added to SciStarter and because of that general awareness raising and um, signal boost to citizen science, quite frankly, there were over 350,000 contributions to SciStarter affiliate projects. That's huge. That's a huge advancement. That's a huge boon to science. Um, and then of people surveyed about citizen science months, so participants, um, two thirds of participants surveyed um, by SciStarter said that Citizen Science Month helped change the way they think about libraries and the services that libraries provide, which is awesome. Um, and then 100% of event organizers, so that could be you all, um, reported that Sit Science Month matched or exceeded their expectations. And beyond that, there were more than 1 million people reached through social media who saw different projects that they could do, or different webinars that they could join, or live online, live, online, live stream events, um, are just interesting things about citizen science, new discoveries, all these different social media posts, more than 1 million people have reached. So it's coming. We're in 2022. That was 2021. Now we're in 2022. And it's time to plan for this next citizen science month. Um, so there's still time to host an event. And I know for some of you, you might need more of a time horizon. So I guess you can start thinking about events later this year, our um, Citizen Science Month 2023, the next April. But if you still have capacity, um, why host an event, right? Um, it's because you understand your community's interests. It's because you want to introduce them to projects that, uh, about co that address the topics that they care about, where they can make a difference. Um, you want to increase science learning. There's all sorts of different learning that goes on with citizen science. It can be small things, just understanding science better and the process of it by actually uh, collecting data yourself. That can be a really um, impactful element of doing citizen science, better understanding the scientific process. But you also learn things about the subject matter. For, uh, we talked about Globe at Night. Every time I do Globe at Night, I learn something new about the night sky because they have a different featured constellation for every one of their monthly campaigns. So I learn more about these constellations when I do Globe at Night and I'm monitoring light pollution. Um, and you can enhance existing programs. So you don't have to plan 
a whole new citizen science program, right? You could plug it into existing affinity groups. If you have Girl Scouts come to your library, there's a the Think Like a Citizen Scientist Girl Scout journey featured on SciStarter. You could um, uh, combine efforts and bring that to them. Our, we talked about astronomy clubs. You can just do Globe at Night with your astronomy club. Or if you have like a senior learning group, um, you could do um, a bird watching project. I know a lot of folks really love bird watching and there are so many different citizen science projects. Claire told me about one earlier where you can help monitor bird populations. The list really goes on. Um, citizen science really goes with everything. Um, and some more survey data from our last citizen science month. 98% um, of participants learned more about citizen science because of Citizen Science Month. 97% of participants better understood how participating in citizen science enhances scientific discovery. And 96% of participants learned about ways to participate in citizen science projects of interest. Because um, it can be a little intimidating, right? The idea that anybody can do science by bringing it to your library and showing step-by-step -step instructions and making it easy and also fun, you give people a way to get started and you could potentially you know, spark a citizen science journey for someone that could be really impactful for them. So now we have a poll. I'll let Claire or Dylan launch this. Um, I'm just curious, because I, I do recognize some names in here. I want to know if anyone in the room with us today has hosted a Citizen Science Month event before. So yes, no, unsure. If you hosted one in 2021 or in 2020, I just wanna know. So we'll give you a few seconds to answer that. Yes, no, unsure. While you do that, I'm gonna take a peek at the chat. Jessica says, I have not, but our clerk definitely has. She's our citizen science go-to. That's amazing, yeah. Citizen science can really bring, you know, an entire library staff together. Um, anyone can really plug in and facilitate an event. I mentioned that, you know, when I was at, um, when I was in school up here in DC, I would just do it at my local library. I would get a room and bring people in to do citizen science. The vast majority of you have not. So we have 13% of people who have hosted a citizen science event before. We have 79% of you who have not. And we have 9% who are unsure. That is A-OK. -okay. We are gonna give you all the tools you need to plan your own citizen science programs today. Great, let's go to the next slide. So there are lots of resources for you to prepare. If you go to citizensciencemonth.org, you can find best practices, case studies, some evaluation and survey templates, program guides, grant opportunities, project recommendations, promotional materials, and so much more. Whenever I see someone use our Citizen Science Month logo, or I see someone use like social media templates we made, it really makes me happy. We, um, we worked really hard to create those for you. And you can modify them to fit your community. Um, and we take um, feedback really seriously. I remember in um, 20, um, late 2019 to prepare for Citizen Science Month 2020, a library told me, we really want a yard sign template with the Citizen Science Month logo. So we made one of those. It's still up there on the resources page. So don't be shy about telling us what you need. Um, the whole Citizen Science Month team, SciStarter and our partners like Arizona State University, we are here to create those things for you. And there's a lot of stuff there already that you can explore and use. Um, so just in general, um, we found these tips helpful. Science Friday, actually, when their Citizen Science Month webinar last year, um, when they presented mainly to libraries um, along with SciStarter, they want they boiled down what makes a program successful. And I wanted to share it with you all here because this has really impacted me as I plan programs. So every program for, that showcases citizen science should have story, experience, and action. The story is why should the viewer care? Um, I'll give the Stall Catchers project as an example. Um, so what's the story behind Stall Catchers? So Stall Catchers, you're catching stalled blood vessels, right? Um, by making these annotations in the game. So Stall Catchers is an online game where people make annotations to study, um, help researchers study Alzheimer's disease. Um, and why should a viewer care? Well, because Alzheimer's may have impacted someone they love or someone in their community, because um, it makes the world a better place if we're able to address Alzheimer's. So that could be the story of stall catchers. Then you have the experience. That's the demo. That's the active component. 
Um, so when I do programs about stall catchers, I, I will just share my screen and I will start making annotations on the screen. And I'll do polls of the people in the event with me. I'll say, what do you all think? Do you think it's a stall? Or do you, do you think this blood vessel is flowing? And people are able to vote and make that annotation along with me. So that's a demo. It's active. It's something people can see um, that if we were in person, you know, they could feel it. They could almost touch it, right? Um, so you have story and you have experience. And the last thing is action. You have a call to action for the viewer and for the participant. Um, and with a citizen science program, the action is easy. It's do citizen science. So after I do my demo, my experience for a stock countries program, I'll usually set people loose. I'll say, okay, now you make a site starter account, go to stall catchers, make a stall catchers account with the same email. Um, so everything tracks back into your site starter dashboard because it is a site starter affiliate project. And I'll say, just start making annotations on your own. Um, and we'll actually stay on the line sometimes for like 20 minutes or so as people start making annotations and sometimes they can get competitive. Stall catchers is a really fun project because you can actually make different teams. And I've seen libraries do this where they'll, um, like in one library system, for example, they might have different branches, have different stall catchers teams. So they can kind of race each other and see in a lighthearted, friendly way who can do the most research and move science forward the most. Um, so whenever you do a program, you have the story, why the viewer should care. You have the experience, which is the demo, the active component. Then you have the action, which is the call for the viewer to participate in the citizen science project. So here's another example. Um, this is actually a project where there's a library kit for it on SciStarter. Find it in the link page that Claire um, so kindly put together for you all. Um, but the great sunflower project. So this is a project where you can do it with any flowering plant. It doesn't have to be a sunflower, any flowering plant. You basically, the only skill you need to participate in this project is you have to know how to count. So for those of you who might be children's librarians, um, this is a great project. I mean, I've done it with people of all ages. I've done it with retirees. I've done it with employees at Verizon. I have, yes, done it with preschoolers. Um, so it's a very, very accessible intergenerational project. But um, this is a project all about pollinators. So the story could be about why pollinators matter. You know, bees are responsible for one third of our food. So that could be my story. Um, and then for the experience, um, I, when I've done online programs with the Great Sunflower Project, I've actually taken my smartphone and I've gone on Zoom in, on my smartphone and just gone outside and started walking around to find my flowering plant. Um, and then for the action, you can collect the data together. So I've been on Zoom with people. I said, okay, are we all outside now? Is everybody sitting by a flowering plant? Let's sit here for five minutes and count the number and type of pollinators that visit. And if no pollinators visit, that's okay. Zero is still a really important data point um, because it shows that pollinators might be in trouble or might need some help. Um, so once again, you have story, you have experience, and you have action. And these three elements add up to a successful citizen science program. Oops, I skipped a slide. So I like examples. I think they help make things real. So here's an example program from last year, um, April 2020. And you don't have to go as hard as this um, group of organizations did in Washington State on Lummi Island. Um, I, you could just do one element of what they did and you would still be a very successful person. Um, but I, they really covered all the bases with their Citizen Science Month program. So they had an online event. I actually joined as a guest speaker. It was a lot of fun where we talked about marine debris and plastic. Um, we talked about best practices for participating in citizen science. And on that same day, so they had everybody join the online event at the start. And then they had people come to the library, get equipment, and go and do a beach cleanup. And then they used a debris tracker citizen science project to report the plastics and um, litter they found to scientists. Um, and then after that event wrapped up, they had other citizen science projects featured and they invited everyone back to the library to engage with their citizen science book display, as well as with the other like hummingbird project, for example, that they had featured some additional data sheets and other activities. So they, they covered all the bases. If you just did a book display, you'd be set. You'd be doing great for citizen science month. There's actually one book in particular I'll give a shout out to. We have a screenshot of it later. But the field guide to citizen science, that's SciStarter's book. Um, SciStarter's founder, Darlene Cavalier, co-authored it. 
Um, so you could put that book out for Citizen Science Month and invite people to explore it in other Citizen Science books. I also recommend the book Citizen Science by Karen Cooper. It was one of my first Citizen Science reads, and I think it does a great job walking through the history of it. Um, and there are also Citizen Science children's books out there. One of my favorites is called Bat Count. Uh, I could talk about that all day, but the, the basic thing you should take from this slide is there's a lot of potential here for citizen science programming, and there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, I mentioned earlier um, online citizen science. So this is um, the Princeton University Library. This is actually them in 2019 during Citizen Science Day. Um, and they were doing the Stall Catchers Project as well as the Snapshot Safari Project on their computers at the computer labs. These are um, students at Princeton. They came in on a Saturday, so give them a shout out. Dedicated, um, civic-minded individuals coming in on a Saturday to volunteer and move science forward. And they made these annotations on their computer um, to make a difference for the Alzheimer's research as well as the Snapshot Safari project. That's a really fun one if you wanna check it out. Um, and the project leader for that's actually in this picture. Her name's Meredith and she is awesome. Um, but the Snapshot Safari Project, you're able to look at camera traps. So those are uh, cameras that are out in a wild area and they capture motion. So you look at pictures of different animals and you classify what those animals are to help researchers like Meredith um, monitor um, how those populations are doing, if they might be in trouble, if there might be an overabundance of certain species in certain areas. Those projects are a lot of fun. So you can do multiple projects in your computer lab. So we mentioned stall catchers, mentioned snapshot safari. There are other citizen science games like Eterna or Fold It. Um, I'll mention the Eterna project. That one's a little bit more challenging. If you have a group where they really love a brain buster, you can recommend Eterna to them. I do it sometimes when I'm in a mood to solve a puzzle and I know some people just really, really love it. Um, it's really, it can be good for middle school on up if you have a particularly advanced group of middle schoolers. But basically what you're doing with Eterna is you're solving puzzles to build models of RNA-based vaccines. And the best designs created by citizen scientists who are solving these puzzles actually get synthesized in a lab at Stanford to contribute to vaccine research. So Eterna is such a cool project. And Fold It's very similar. That's another computer program where um, right now they're very laser focused on COVID. You can find all of those projects on SciStarter.org forward slash NLM. That's where we tend to point people to find a featured project for Citizen Science Month. Um, and of course, that's in the link bank that Claire shared. So we asked- Carolyn, there was actually a question that came up in the chat I think uh, would be really cool. Uh, Let's do uh, it. Um, Jen, or actually, sorry, uh, Amy O'Connell asked, uh, has, any, uh, are there, has anyone done a Citizen Science program as a take and make program? Or are there any resources that SciStarter has about doing some Citizen Science remotely as a lot of the librarians we're working with uh, are still dealing with remote programming due to the ongoing COVID crisis? Yes, definitely. Um, the library network page is a great resource for um, all things library. In terms of remote programs, we also have a lot of advice on our Citizen Science Month resources page about webinars, our live online events. Those tend to be very popular. Um, and those projects that are featured on SciStarter.org forward slash NLM, you could just um, share any of them on social media to invite people to participate remotely. Um, and if you do the Stall Catchers project, you can make a team for your library and we'd be able to keep track of people's efforts remotely. But I think a lot of people would do online citizen science meetups for remote programming. That was what I saw most commonly. Um, there have been take and makes. Um, I'll, um, have the I'll actually ask the library network about that um, because resources for those on SciStarter side don't immediately pop to mind, but I know there's something. I'm just like so steeped in the online live streamed event world that I'm not thinking of any take and makes immediately. But yes, remote programs are definitely possible. And pretty much any of those projects on that NLM page, you could do remotely with your patrons and your community. Are there any other questions, Dylan? So far that's it. Awesome. Um, and some of these are really good to do. So I mentioned, you know, uh, if you do a game day to support Alzheimer's research with stall catchers, you can very easily do that in Zoom or WebEx or whatever you happen to use at your library. Or you could even just live stream yourself on your library's Facebook page, participating and explaining it to your patrons. 
Um, are there are also uh, there are going to be some keynote events for Citizen Science Month? Keep your eyes on SciStarter Citizen Science Month calendar. Another remote programming idea is you could do a watch party um, at with your um, your community where you all watch a SciStarter keynote event with a partner like National Geographic, for example, um, Science Friday, or others. Um, and if you have to be socially distant while you're participating, you could do a bio blitz or a walking cleanup tour. A bio blitz, they, it typically uses the iNaturalist project. You basically ask people to go out with a smartphone or a tablet um, and document as many species as possible, as many different types of plants or animals as possible. Um, so bio blitzes are really popular. You can do that remotely. You don't have to have everybody in person together or you can do that socially distant and you could do walking cleanup tours. Um, you can invite everyone to use the debris tracker app. Um, it doesn't have to be on the ocean. You can participate in landlocked areas as well. Um, and you can ask people to clean up the community and also document the litter that they're cleaning up to contribute to research-based understanding, data-driven understanding of what litter is occurring where. And researchers looking at these patterns can help um, point out upstream solutions potentially. So you can definitely do a socially distant community cleanup or you know, a completely remote community cleanup have people document the litter they're cleaning up with the debris tracker app. Um, so kits, you know, we were talking about kits earlier. We really recommend looking at the templates we provided for exploring biodiversity. That's the iNaturalist project, or the observing pollinators. That's the great sunflower project. Our measuring light in the night. We talked about globe and night. Oh my gosh, we talked about almost all of these kits already. There's also one. Um, there are other kits as well. But um, go through these templates, explore what might be the best fit for your library. Feel free to print these instructions and wrap cards out um, and modify them if you need to. Add your own library logo and have fun with it and start circulating them. Um, or you can just simply introduce citizen science to library users. We mentioned that training, scistarter.org forward slash training. If your community members uh, participate in this training, they get a badge. And it's, it's a lot of fun. It's um, completely online. It's interactive. There are quizzes, there are videos. And at the end of it, you can put that badge on your LinkedIn or just print it out for bragging rights. Um, and along with this training, there are um, some slides and speaker notes to help you introduce it to your library if you do an online or in-person program about it. And definitely, definitely participate in that library training as well. That's the secondary training for library staff that comes after the general training that anyone can do. Um, so some sample itineraries, if you're trying to think through what an event could look like. In the morning, maybe you do a bird hike with eBird. And then in the afternoon, maybe you do a get to know citizen science session where you just walk through the basics of citizen science with your local community. They did this at the Millbridge Public Library in Maine. And here's a quote from last year's Citizen Science Month. It was a fun day of ex exploration, and we are hoping to participate again this year. Um, are the Fletcher Free Library in Burlington, Vermont. They hosted in-person programs on the library lawn with Birds of Vermont, so with a community partner, community organization. And they distributed kits and partnered with local senior centers to expand science education and research. So one fun compliment is let's say I'm doing a bird project um, and I'm having everyone participate in the eBird project to document uh, birds in the community. I can also invite a bird expert just to share some complimentary knowledge about birds to deepen the understanding that my um, community may be getting from participating in eBird. You can pair these things together. Or if you're doing the stockholders project, maybe you could invite a local brain expert to talk about, you know, Alzheimer's and things that people should know. So while you're, you know, making these annotations, and helping Alzheimer's researchers, you could also have subject matter experts separate from the Citizen Science Project talk about related topics to really create um, an environment of learning. So there are so many different sample itineraries we could go through. I know that you all will come up with the best one for your community. And once you do come up with an event, please edit the SciStarter. Okay, so you don't need to create something new to participate in Citizen Science Month. We talked about book displays. You could also print out SciStarter's bookmarks, our shelf talkers. Um, there are also interactive posters. You can see that there's a poster here where people are able to answer questions about citizen science with sticky notes. Those are always some of my favorite displays because I like seeing what people write. Um, and sometimes the answers surprise me. You could circulate um, citizen science books or you know, bring citizen science to your book club. Um, and there we talk about affinity groups. You know, it really, it goes with everything 
and you can find the right project for each affinity group. So here's an example of a citizen science book display. This was another rock star library last year. They did such a great job in 2021. They did all sorts of different citizen science programming in their story times. Um, they did it um, They did with their astronomy club, with their local aquarium. Um, and they also had book displays. And you can see that they printed out SciStarter's templates, but they've also made it their own. They've put the citizen science month logo and different citizen science library logos from SciStarter on their own materials. So they definitely took our templates and ran with it, which I love. And here's an example of the same library at story time reading a citizen science children's book. And we also recommend the field guide to citizen science as a um, introduction to this whole field for your community. Or as the saying goes, join the citizen science brigade and start making a difference. Um, so just to kind of give you a little bit more of a menu of options, if you're not ready to do a full-fledged program for Citizen Science Month, or you don't think you have resources for a book display or print out bookmarks or what have you, feel free to just embed our Project Finder widget on your website. Um, you can go to scistarter.org forward slash widget forward slash new. Um, you can customize it a little bit based on what you think your community's preferences will be. And it's a little search engine that can be on your own website to link people up to real science they can do. Um, and you can also just, uh, as an individual or on the behalf of your community, start perusing the project finder to find a project that works for you. I rec and you can search by activity, you can search by age group, um, you can search by location if you're really interested in local projects. Um, one local project that I love that I wish we had in Florida is called Blue Thumb. It's a water monitoring project in Oklahoma. I attended one of their webinars last year and I was really inspired um, by their approach to monitoring water quality. Um, there are also other awesome water quality monitoring projects. Earth Echo is one that comes to mind that you can do globally. But um, you can definitely find a local project that's relevant to your state or city even. Sometimes projects might be targeted on just like one creek in one city. I've seen that before. And some projects might be global, like the Stall Catchers project that you can do anywhere on earth where you have internet access. Just go through this project finder and discover for yourself. Uh, one pro tip I like to give is um, search and the only projects that field, you can select and look at only projects that are SciStarter affiliates. Um, SciStarter affiliate projects, you're able to track the number and frequency of your contributions in your SciStarter dashboard. And there are also free tools on SciStarter um, if you dig a little bit more, you'll see that anyone has the ability to create a list of citizen science projects that you can share with others. For SciStarter affiliate projects, you can actually see the number of contributions per project by people you've shared your list with. And I've seen libraries do this as a way of monitoring their collective impact. Um, so just a pro tip, feel free to prioritize those SciStarter affiliate projects. There are lots of awesome projects on SciStarter, but I really like the additional tracking um, and ability to get credit that SciStarter affiliates provide. Um, we talked about the affinity groups again. I just want you all to see what it could look like. You know, you're monitoring pollinators with people of all ages. You're um, doing globe at night uh, with your astronomy club. You're going out on a hike with your adult learning group and documenting the species in your community. The list really goes on. Uh, and we mentioned tuning into other events. So some, there are some keynotes coming up that are gonna be added to the SciStarter platform. So keep monitoring that calendar. But just to kind of give you a teaser, um, PBS's Ken Burns, Ben Franklin film is gonna release in April. And there's gonna be some Citizen Science Month programming surrounding that. So you can host a watch party for that. You could do it you know, in person at the library, maybe you throw it up on a, a big screen or in the computer lab. Um, or you could just, you know, share a live stream on your Facebook page. Same with Discover and Astronomy Magazines. They're going to have some live webinars um, talking about um, favorite projects. And then the National Library of Medicine, they do a ton of stuff in citizen science. We actually had an event I thought was really impactful earlier this week where folks in um, Wisconsin talked about the All of Us Research Program, which is a precision medicine study. And they talked about how it might revolutionize health research and make it more inclusive just by having individuals across the United States um, fill out surveys and share samples like um, uh, health samples with the program. So uh, medicine can be customized to help more people. 
Um, I thought it was really cool about how we'll reduce disparities in health. And the All of Us Research Program, they love working with libraries. And we actually have some All of Us resources on our Citizen Science Month site. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely be doing more All of Us programs in April. And you can start exploring the resources now. All right, so how might you participate in Citizen Science Month? I'm gonna pause for a second. I might take a sip of my milkshake and we'll see what comes in on the chat. Um, and then maybe we can have Dylan read out what people might be saying. Oh, Darlene mentioned that um, some of the Build-A-Kit projects could be adapted to be take and make projects. Um, and yes, don't include the sensor if you're doing a take and make, that might get really expensive really fast. Uh, so, so I want to know what kind of milkshake you're drinking, Caroline. I am drinking a uh, mint chocolate chip milkshake. Ooh. It's very good. Ooh, it looks like Kathleen. Stall catchers. That's exciting. Come on, everybody. I know more of you want to do things. You can also just say how you're going to participate as an individual. We got a DIY lantern fly trap. As an idea, that sounds awesome. Stall catchers and bird counters. At least a book display, excellent. Butterfly, uh, Janice is talking about a butterfly garden at their library, so a pollinator project would be easy. Integrating, that's a great point about integrating some of these resources with programming you're already doing. I know the science department see if they're interested in helping me plan. There we go. Monarch programs twice a year. Earth Day events. BioBlitz looking for pollinators and planting wildflowers, recycling events, uh, incorporating with uh, summer reading, especially for Oceans of Possibilities for CSLP this summer, also really great. More passive programming, pollinator projects and book displays, uh, BioBlitz and Monarch Waste Station nearby. So that's a great thing to introduce some stuff around pollinators. Uh, groups monitoring water, water quality in local rivers, that's fantastic. Pollinator projects and uh, bird counts. Star parties, as you know, we're from the Space Science Institute, always down for more astronomy programming. Uh, squirrels on our campus, so something related to that. Book displays, intro to citizen science, measuring light in the night, exploring biodiversity and pollinator projects. A seed library is a great idea for a project. Um, partnered with neighborhood forests to give away trees. Stony Hill Public Library is putting together an observing pollinators kit. So many great ideas coming out. More pollinators. Uh, oh my marine gosh. debris tracker. Ooh. <laughs> this is so good. I this love is so fantastic. This. BioBlitz is most uh, feasible for Kauai for children and their families. Excellent. Bird ID, more iNaturalist stuff. Oh, so many great ideas here in the chat. Tree ID. That's great. I think a lot of the common themes that we're seeing too are using resources that are like nearby, not necessarily at, trying to do a huge lift, but looking around what's around you, what resources can, uh, can you uh, integrate that you're uh, with programming you're already doing, uh, natural resources around you, local partners you might be able to work with, backyard animals. This is all so great, y'all. Oh my gosh, yeah, Dylan, I don't want you to lose your voice, <laughs> so I'll let you be. Um, but that's amazing. Thank you for reading all those out. And I have some good news um, for everybody who shared something. You can add all of that to SciStarter. You can go to SciStarter.org forward slash add, even if you're just doing a book display. Um, and you can add your program so we can celebrate it. Um, part of what we, why we do that is um, I'm going to stop sharing for just one second. I'm experiencing a little bit of a glitch. But part of the reason why we do that is um, so we can include y'all in the evaluation, so we can send you surveys that you can distribute to your participants um, or that you can take yourselves to give us feedback about how we're doing. Um, and we also do that because I use the people finder a lot. I'll just randomly, um, if I see an event, like sometimes someone in Hawaii might add an event and I'll just randomly, add, um, they might not use the people finder and I'll do it for them. I'll say, hey, this library in Hawaii is doing an event. You should definitely participate. Um, and the list really goes on. Um, okay, why am I having these tech difficulties? I'll talk through the rest of it. I only have a few slides left anyway, so that's a-okay. Darlene, um, sorry, um, Caroline, if you would like, I can share. 
Just all right, I'll, uh, I'll let you drive us through the last few slides. I'll talk through them. That sounds good. And thanks for doing that, Claire. I appreciate you. Of course. So we, we did our poll and we gave the very good news that all of you can add that to SciStarter so we can celebrate you. Um, and now we're gonna give you some quick tips to promote your events. So Claire, will you go to the next slide? Um, so this is an example of a social media graphic that we have for free for you to download on citizenscienceMonth.org, but it's also me urging you to add your own event and use free resources to plan and promote it. And just to emphasize, events are different than projects. Typically, events feature projects, so you'll discover a project like NASA's Globe Observer that you can do anywhere in the world to help NASA study the Earth. Um, and you might have your own book club meeting about it or because they, they have some really great materials for kids if you want to do a story time or you might bring it to your adult learning group or so on and so forth. And then you would add that event to SciStarter. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, and by doing that, like I said, you just help us learn what libraries are doing across the country and quite frankly around the world. And we can help you promote your event. We tweet them out, we use the People Finder. You can also use the People Finder. Um, and it's just a great way for us to celebrate you. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, and these are some of the resources. We've mentioned them. Uh, use these bookmarks. Um, you can print them as is, add your own logo, use our flyers. You saw the Walport Public Library earlier. They did a great job of printing out the flyers and really using them to the fullest. And use those graphics to promote your citizen science efforts. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and there are other things too, other downloadable resources. This isn't even the beginning. Um, so there's, there are certificates. Um, there are um, buttons that you can use. There are interactive posters and so much more. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and social media assets. These are big, you know, there are um, profile picture frames. You can, I've seen libraries actually take their library's profile picture Facebook and put the frame over it. Um, that, that graphic I've seen libraries use as cover photos on Facebook or on Twitter uh, and so much more. You can really be creative with it. And we're adding more and more of those and we do it based on feedback from you all. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and some of these resources are pretty evergreen. Um, so we have a YouTube playlist and also many um, live streamed events archived on Facebook. Um, and one example is one of NASA and NASA Goddard Space Center. They used one of our events that we did for Citizen Science Month 2020 to do a watch party after the, the fact. They did a recording. They showed, sent it to everyone and said, let's all watch this. And it was um, an interview we did with the creators of the Chasing Steve documentary, as well as the citizen scientists who discovered Steve. And Steve is a new type of aurora in the night sky up in Canada. Um, that was a very, very um, big discovery by citizen scientists that was of interest to NASA. And they really enjoyed watching the live stream we, event we did with documentarians and citizen scientists related to Steve. So you can, you can do the same thing. You can use one of our recordings of past events or from a, a project um, to watch it with your community and hopefully participate in the project. We'll go to the next slide. So next steps, uh, let's, let's keep going. Um, so we have office hours each week. Um, you can sign up for some facilitator updates. Um, you also get facilitator updates from the library network too, if you saw that. You can add your program as our event to SciStarter. And that's actually where I was gonna stop, Claire, if you wanna go ahead and skip to your slides, ask some questions. We've had many questions throughout, which I think is great. So maybe Claire, do you wanna wrap us up and then we'll go back to questions? Sure. Um, yeah, just for those of you who need to jump off, I wanted to give a quick promotional uh, shout out uh, for our next StarNet webinar. So this is another free webinar on March 23rd at 1 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, this is called Our Blue Planet Earth. So this ties into the CSL LP theme, uh, summer reading theme, Oceans of Possibilities. Um, we will have a subject matter expert join us to talk about sea ice um, on our planet. And then we will also have a subject matter expert joining us to talk about oceans on other worlds. Uh, so beyond just Earth, there are other objects out there that have oceans. So we'll talk about how NASA um, explores those other places. Um, so please join us. You can register at starnetlibraries.org slash event slash 
our-blue-planet-earth. We'd love to see you all there. Um, so I'll turn it back over to questions. If there are any, uh, it, Beatrice just dropped our certificate of attendance in the chat as well. If you would like to download that to show that you participated in this professional development. Um, but otherwise we'll stick around for a little bit uh, if there are any questions. And also big thanks to Caroline. That was so much amazing resources that you shared with us. Um, so many great ideas. Um, I hope you all are walking away with some inspiration and ideas for how to do citizen science at your library. We did have a question come up in the chat. Leah asked, uh, speaking of NASA, has anyone done a citizen science program in collaboration with the James Webb Space Telescope? Not that I know of, but probably maybe. I'll definitely look that up. That's a very good question. I'm sure there's probably some great uh, night sky or astronomy uh, kits or sci SID science programs that you can integrate if you are doing any programming around James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, night sky examinations, maybe doing something in uh, drawing together views of the night sky from Earth and the views of the night sky that James Webb will be getting in orbit, especially if you're doing anything around first images, uh, which are coming up, you know, in a, in a few months. So that's an idea. This is cool stuff. Great. Well, well, I think we'll hang around for the next few minutes if these people have more questions. But if people need to hop off, uh, definitely do that. Get to your next meeting. But otherwise, you know, we're always here for you as a resource. I love the questions about the Webb Space Telescope. We do have a recording about the James Webb Space Telescope where we had another subject matter expert, um, Dr. Alexandra Lockwood joined us. Um, so you can find that in the link bank, there's a link to our Starnet webinar recording. So check that out for more information about the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and yes, Amy, there will be a recording of this on our StarNet webinar page. Um, it'll be up in about 48 hours, um, but if you click on, yeah, Dylan, Dylan just put it in the chat. All of our webinars are recorded and posted there. So you can even go back and compare this with last year's <laughs> Citizen Science webinar. We always record them and upload them there along with the slides, the chat transcript and the link thing. You will also be able to find it on the StarNet YouTube channel. Uh, we're seeing some more thank yous come in. That's great. Please, everybody, just one more plea. Add your events to SciStarter once you have them. And even if it's just a book display that's up for April, add that too. And you can just say April 1st through April 30th. We just want to celebrate you. Great. Well, if there are no more questions, um, Caroline, thank you again so much for a great presentation. And Dylan, thank you for monitoring the chat. Um, I think I'm gonna go ahead and stop the webinar. And um, Caroline, if you could maybe email me a list of those books you were talking about, I'll add them to the link Ooh, bank. We have the, we have book list link, book list linked on citizensciencemonth.org forward slash resources. So oh, people should be able to find their way there. And um, let's see, I can try to grab them just directly. Yeah, we have three different book lists linked on the Citizen Science Month page. There's one for pollinators. There's one for, uh, I think, just like a general one. Um, I think there's another one for astronomy. Okay, great. I'll just find those and add them to the link bank and then um, everyone will have access to that. Yeah, yes. CitizenScienceMonth.org forward slash resources. Awesome. All, all right. right. Well, I'm not saying anything else. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Talk soon.
Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.